Bible reading this evening is from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 to 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 to 16. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom amongst the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have had crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. The man without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct them? But we have the mind of Christ. This is God's word. There's some really interesting verses there. One of the most misquoted verses uh, comes up there, which is uh, really interesting. Um, I used to misquote it as well until I, uh, quite a while ago, went through the passage more carefully. Um, this, in a sense, is, is almost the second part of what Pastor Nathan did last week. So if for whatever reason you weren't here last week and you missed Pastor Nathan's sermon, can I encourage you to access it online and have a listen? Uh, he dealt with the subject really well, and it's, it's almost kind of if you've missed that, it doesn't provide the context for this, if that makes sense. But if you heard what Nathan preached about last week, then you'll understand the context of what comes in this particular passage. Let's ask the Lord to help us to do the very thing that the Apostle Paul calls for us to do in this passage. Our Father, we are so grateful for the Spirit of God. We know that He is a person, that He is the third person of the Trinity. Forgive us when we reduce Him to less than a person. We also know that You are one God, Father, Son, and Spirit. So forgive us when we divide You into three and treat you as though you were three different gods, when in fact you are only one God. And we thank you that the Spirit has been given to us as the one who opens our eyes, the one who helps us to see. And your word declares so clearly in this passage that it is the Spirit of God who must help us to see, otherwise we won't see. And so we pray this evening that since spiritual things are spiritually discerned, as the Apostle Paul preaches, that you would help us to understand what is being preached tonight. Not because we have wisdom in and of ourselves to discern your word, but because the Spirit of God is present in this building. And because the Spirit of God is the one who lifts the scales from our eyes, the spiritual scales, and opens them to understand. May he be at work amongst us this evening from person to person. Amen. One of the realities that I've had to deal with in all my pastoral experience is the fact that you can go to a family of, let's say, three or four who have been raised in a Christian home, 
who have been taught the Christian truths by their parents, who have had Christianity Christ modeled by their parents, whose parents have been faithful and taught them the scriptures from when they were uh, small children, and yet two follow Christ and one doesn't. Or three follow Christ and one doesn't. Or one follows Christ and two don't. And what is it that causes this kind of situation to arise? Or alternatively, you may sit down with someone and begin to explain to them the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and suddenly that the eyes open and, and they understand and they look at you and they want to confess Christ and Lord. I remember doing it to a young lady when we were on an a evangelism team. Two of us had gone into her home. One was speaking to her mother. I was talking to this girl. And suddenly she said, I see, I see, I see. What do I need to do? And then others, you sit down and you explain the gospel again and again and again. And it's as if there's this barrier that comes up and they just don't see. What's the difference? The difference, says the Apostle Paul, is the work of the Spirit on one and not the other. Sometimes I think our evangelism, our wanting to share the gospel, is not inhibited because we don't know how to share the gospel. All of you know how to share the gospel if you're a Christian, every one of you. You may think you don't, but you do, because it's simply a, a, sharing your testimony, sharing what God has done for you in Christ, and, and every Christian can do that. No, the issue sometimes is that Perhaps we haven't spent enough time on our knees praying that when we do share the gospel, the person to whom we are sharing's eyes will be opened. Now, I know some of you have done that, and you have got down on your knees, and you have prayed, and you have pleaded with the Lord, and, and still there seems to be a barrier that comes between you and the person when it comes to sharing the gospel. And what the Apostle Paul wants to remind us of this evening is that you cannot see someone transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light unless the Spirit of God does the work. If we rely on our own ingenuity, if we rely on our own abilities, if we think that somehow through clever persuasion, through debate and argument, we can argue someone into the kingdom of God, you are going to be disappointed again and again and again. It is the Spirit of God who suddenly makes what seems foolish to the world wise. So firstly, I want you to notice the nature of true wisdom, verses 6 to 9. The nature of true wisdom. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature. Now, what's he talking about there? Well, he's simply saying that there are believers who understand, believers who are mature in their spiritual walk, those who have grown spiritually, and that wisdom is spoken to them. They understand. They get it because spiritually they have progressed. But not the wisdom, he says, of this age, or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. Now, what the Apostle Paul is doing is contrasting two different uh, positions of people. On the one hand, you have Christians who have understood something of Christianity, and then you have non-Christians who don't understand. And the Apostle Paul says they are coming to nothing. In what sense are they coming to nothing? In two senses. In the sense that they are destined for an eternity in hell. There's no other way to say it. But that is their destination. And so they are coming to nothing. In the world's eyes, they may look great. In the world's eyes, they may be prominent. In the world's eyes, they may have been raised up to high positions. And people might admire and respect them. In fact, that was happening in the Corinthian church. They were looking into some of the rulers of the world, and they were esteeming them and putting them on pedestals and thinking these, these wise rulers are, 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 are so incredibly special. And yet, Paul says, they know nothing. They're coming to ruin. They're coming to nothing. They're going to end up languishing in eternity, which is the only place that really matters at the end of the day, isn't it? 
You might enjoy some pleasures now. You might enjoy and get some enjoyment out of life now, but life ends so fast in this world that soon you are transported into the world to come and then forever, and then what will you amount to? There's a second sense. The uh, the other sense is that the wisdom that they espouse of this world, the wisdom by which they operate, and the ethical ways and moral ways by which they live, those things are all going to come to an end. They're going to come to nothing. Yes, they may defy God now. Yes, they may live according to their own wisdom. Yes, their whole morality may be based upon a secular mindset. And yes, there may be no objective ethics in that. And it's a subjective, I decide what's right or wrong. And I determine the truth and what's not true. But at the end of the day, when they die, what then? What then? There are going to be some shocked people one day. And they're going to realize that everything they've placed their faith in, everything they've lived for, everything they've put confidence in, is rubble, is nothing. And they're going to be lost forever. And so you see what the Apostle Paul is trying to say is, don't put people on a pedestal who are amounting to nothing. No, verse 7. We speak of God's secret wisdom. Now, that could be God's, the word is in the Greek, mystery. God's mystery wisdom or mysterious wisdom. A wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. Now, what on earth is the Apostle Paul saying there? What is this wisdom that's been hidden and how has it now suddenly been revealed? Well, the reality is, That for the rulers of this world who have positions of great power, the wisdom of God has not been something that they have grasped. So, for example, when you present the gospel to the unbeliever, for them it's foolish. I mean, after all, what kind of a gospel would cause a savior to be sacrificed on the cross? What kind of a leader is that? What kind of a rescue plan is that? And so for them, the foolishness of the gospel is exactly that. But you see, this is the wisdom of God, and they don't grasp the wisdom of God. They don't understand the wisdom of God because God has not revealed it to them. And as a result of that, they eventually participate in the death of Christ, as the apostle will say, a wisdom that has been hidden from them. Hidden in the sense that they think that God's plan of salvation is really, really weird, strange. But notice what he says, that has been destined for our glory before time began. What does he mean by that? Well, he's simply saying that there was a point in history according to God's divine sovereignty and plan where God determined that his glory would be revealed in the most graphic way possible. How does God reveal his glory? And how is that glory then affect us? And in what sense does it affect us? Well, God's glory is revealed in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the God of all glory, who's come into our realm, into our world, and as he has lived amongst us, he has revealed the glory of God, and as he dies on the cross, we see the glory of God revealed in his death on the cross of all places. What a strange place to reveal the glory of God. And then, as a result of the glory of God being revealed in the death of Christ, in the person of Christ, now what happens is those who come to Christ reveal the glory of God insofar as they become part of God's family and Christ is planted in them and the Holy Spirit makes Christ real to them and as they live in a way that is consistent with who Jesus is, so God's glory is revealed in them. Do you hear that, Christian? That as you live for the Lord Jesus Christ... God is revealing his glory by the way in which you live. What an incredible responsibility. We show the glory of God by the way that we live. 
None of these rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, again, you see what the Apostle Paul is saying. Had they understood that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. Now, he's not talking about the Jews, although he is including the Jews in that. But he's talking about those who were rulers, those who are outside of Christ. Had they understood this is the Messiah, they would have never put him to death. Now, that doesn't mean that somehow God's plan of Jesus Christ dying on the cross would have been thwarted. The fact is that God determined in eternity that the only way in which he could save humankind was by the Lord Jesus Christ dying for the sin of the world, taking the sin of the world upon him, uh, taking the punishment of God in their place, bearing the penalty of the sin, experiencing the judgment of God so they don't have to be judged by God. Now, that was always going to happen. It was always part of God's plan. And the Apostle Paul is simply saying, had they understood that this is the Messiah, they would have not participated in that. But they didn't. They were in darkness. And so they participated in his death. And then this misunderstood verse in Scripture. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him, but God has revealed it to us by his Spirit. Now, we hear that quoted about heaven, don't we? And we hear people sometimes in prayer meetings say, as they pray, no eyes see, no uh, ear is conceived. We, 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 we can't imagine what heaven is like. Now, that is true, but it's not true of that verse. What that verse is saying is that in terms of those who are outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, they don't understand the gospel. They don't see it. They can't see it. And the reason they can't see it is because they are plagued by darkness. Sin has caused their minds to be darkened. And until the veil of sin is removed and the light shines into where the darkness is, they do not understand. They cannot understand. No one, in other words, comes to faith on their own steam. No one. I don't just wake up one morning and decide, today's the day that I'm going to follow Christ. Today's the day that I'm going to commit my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't happen like that. It happens through the Spirit of God coming and revealing Himself. If I can paraphrase it like this. We speak God's wisdom, salvation, through Jesus Christ crucified which none of the rulers of this age understood. But even as it is written, what no one could see or understand about God's ways, these things God has prepared for those who love him. Which means that as believers, as Christians, we should be praying that those who are lost in their sin and darkened in their understanding come to faith in Christ before it's too late. There's a wonderful poem written by Jill Briscoe. It goes like this. I had a little wish wand and waved it to and fro. Whenever thoughts turned heavenward or the other place you go, I thought it safe to trust it with my whole eternal soul, so I wished the life I'd lived on earth would get me to my goal. I wished that all would get to heaven, whatever they believed, that Buddha sat at God's right hand, that new age be received. I wished that Paul would change his mind, that Jesus wasn't right, because he spoke of lostness and a dark eternal night. About the way to heaven, one truth, one narrow gate. And I was so broad-minded that I wished away my fate. So I waved my little wish wand in the radiant face of him who met me at the gate of heaven and wouldn't let me in. I wrote to heaven's congressman, but he courteously replied that I should have left my wish wand at the feet of him who died. For wishes could not wish away a lifetime of rejection, and wishes could not dress my soul in heaven's own perfection. 
and wishes could not save me now, for hell was so obscene, that wishes there die ghastly death strangled with a scream. So I took my little wish wand into hell the day I died, and I waved it at the serpent as he slithered to my side. It was dark, but I could see him, and all I knew was fear, and no matter how I waved my wand, he wouldn't disappear. Oh, I wish that I'd wished aright, and I wished I lived again. I wished I had a body that was whole, not racked with pain. I wished I could remember something other than the dirt. I wished I could forget my sin, so every memory hurt. Oh, I wished and wished and wished that I could have another chance to cast upon the crucified a trusting, saving glance. But the devil took my wish one and he laughed right in my face. And I went to live eternally in darkness and disgrace. I never wished a wish again. I had no heart to try. For hell is where hope ended and where all my wishes died. Only the Spirit of God brings life. What this means is practically as no one comes to understand the gospel on their own strength. God's wisdom is completely different to the wisdom of this world. And enlightenment comes not through clever arguments, but through a demonstration of the Spirit's power who falls upon a person and opens their eyes. And so for you and I as believers here tonight, it is for us our heart cry and our prayer that God would reveal his light, that God would open the eyes, that God through his spirit would work his grace in the lives of those who consider Christianity foolishness, who look at the cross and scorn it and reject it and turn away from Jesus and think it's all a big fairy tale. We pray, we plead, we ask God on our knees that he would come upon them by his spirit and take his word, his gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation, and burn it upon the hearts and souls of those who are lost. That is our only hope. You and I will not persuade anyone to become a Christian. But the spirit of God, that's a different matter. He can take the most hardened of heart And he can change it into a heart that loves God. That's our hope. So can I encourage you, before you embark in sharing the gospel, spend some time in prayer pleading that the Spirit of God would do the work that you and I cannot do and change the heart of darkness into a heart of light. And let me tell you, God's Spirit can do amazing things. Secondly, the understanding of true wisdom. Look at verses 10 to 16. He continues. But God has revealed it to us, my Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God, for whom I men knows the thoughts of a man, except the man's spirit within him. In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. Now, I want you to follow the logic of the Apostle Paul. It's fairly, it's Greek logic that he's using here, but it's fairly simple logic. He's saying that if you are going to understand the gospel, then the way you understand the gospel is through the spirit. And the reason you can understand the gospel through the Spirit is because the Spirit has an access to the mind of God. Well, in fact, the Spirit is God. So in the same way that none of you know what my thoughts are, and I don't know what your thoughts are, thank goodness for that, because I'd hate to know what some of you are thinking right now, but you, 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 you don't discern my thoughts unless I tell you what my thoughts are. If I tell you what my thoughts are, then you understand something of what's going on in this empty head of mine. If 
you have the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God is God, and the Spirit of God searches the mind of God, not in the sense that he wants information, he has all the information, but in the sense that he might reveal God to you, then you understand the mind of God and the mind of Christ. Because the Spirit who is God reveals God's thoughts to us. And you can't know God unless you know the Spirit. It's impossible. And it is only through the Spirit bringing revelation, illumination, that you and I understand anything about God. And so you see, the world walks around in darkness and doesn't understand the things of God precisely because they don't have the Spirit of God revealing the things of God to them. And so for them, certain things that Christians engage in are strange, are unusual, are different, are, are a little bit weird. And the judgments they make about Christians are wrong judgments because they judge Christians as foolish or they judge them as stupid or they judge them as weird. But the judgments that they are making are judgments apart from the wisdom that comes from the Spirit of God, do you see? And so in other words, what the Apostle Paul is saying, and he goes on to say this, is that the only way you can really make right judgments about God and about Christians is if you had the Spirit of God. If you don't have the Spirit of God, whatever judgment you are making is bereft, is, 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 it lacks the wisdom that you need to make a right judgment. And so we understand that unbelievers, of course, are going to judge and misjudge Christians. And we see this all the time, don't we? So when you and I as Christian, for example, speak about the fact that abortion is a sin, we have the world that says, how can you say that? How can you say to a woman that she shouldn't have control of her own body? How dare you say that she shouldn't be able to decide whether or not she's going to have a child? We say, but, but children are created by God. They are conceived by God. God brings them into being. And, and you don't take away what God has created. You don't have the right to do that. They don't understand. Why don't they understand? Because they don't have the Spirit of God. And you see, what that means for you and I is you and I should not be surprised when the world makes bad judgments about what Christians believe or how we live. You should expect that. They can't help it. They're lost in their sin. They are uh, driven by their darkness. They are driven by the darkened mind. And so it is a result of the mind that they have that is controlled ultimately by Satan who directs their thinking even though they don't realize it, even though they don't know it, that they form opinions of Christians and Christianity that are patently wrong. We have not received the spirit of the world but the Spirit is from God that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Do you hear that? The spiritual man, now look at the contrast. It's really important that we get this contrast. The spiritual man makes judgment about all things, but he is not subject to any man's judgment. Now let me explain that phrase because it's been misunderstood. That phrase is not saying that a Christian is not subject to any form of judgment by other Christians. Because in chapter 5, Paul is going to say in the strongest possible terms, form, make a judgment about the immoral man in your midst and expel him, kick him out. So, so this isn't a, 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 a kind of verse that a Christian leader can say and say, well, well, you Christians, you can't judge me because you're not allowed to make spiritual judgments about me uh, when I sin. That's between me and God. No, no, no. This is simply saying that the people out there in the world can't judge correctly what Christians are all about. It's impossible. How can you judge something when you don't have the wisdom to make a right judgment. It's, it's the same as me going to a plumber 
and saying to a plumber, by the way, you're using the wrong tools. That's the wrong pipe you've got. How, why are you fiddling over there? You should be fiddling over there when I don't have a clue. He's been trained. He has the wisdom. He has the knowledge. I don't. And here I'm telling him how to do his job. It's ridiculous. It's the same as the unbeliever. It is God who enables us to understand truths about God. Spiritual truths are spiritually discerned. You cannot understand the word of God, which is God's truth, unless the Spirit gives you insight into understanding the truth of God. Now, this has tremendous application, not only for the unbeliever, but for the believer. What that means is then when we sit here tonight, for example, or in a morning service, that only those who've been spiritually enlightened understand what's being preached. No wonder some people fall asleep. They haven't got a clue. And they haven't got a clue because they're not spiritually switched on. And they're not spiritually switched on because the Spirit hasn't switched them on. And so while they may sit here and make judgments and say what's being preached is rubbish or nonsense or whatever the case might be, it, it is wrong judgments because they don't really know. How can they make a judgment? But conversely, the spiritual person who has been given wisdom from God, they are able to make moral judgments in every realm. Because they have God's wisdom. Now, you see what that means. You see, when you work out the implications of this, it's quite significant. So it means that when we come to issues like transgenderism, homosexuality, when it comes to sexual ethics, living together, sleeping together, adultery, all of these things, the only people who make right judgments about all of those things are believers who have the Spirit of God. Only those who have the enlightenment of God, only those who have been given proper understanding of how all of these things work together. Because it's God's world, God has created us, God has given us a, a, a book that teaches us how we are to live, God has enabled us to live in a way that maximizes our fulfillment in this world, and that is only gained by coming into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ who opens our eyes to understand things we cannot understand unless we have God's Spirit dwelling within us. So do you realize, dear Christian here this evening, that whatever wisdom you possess is infinitely greater than whatever wisdom is possessed by the non-Christian out there. Do you realize that? Do you realize the judgment calls you make are based upon what God's Spirit has revealed to you? And since the Spirit of God searches the mind of God and He knows the mind of Christ, for He is God, you have that same mind by God's Spirit. That's incredible. So your wisdom that God has given you far exceeds any perceived wisdom and knowledge out there. And yet, the unbeliever thinks exactly the opposite is true. Not so? They think Christians are well, living in a world of illusion, delusion. That they are deceived, that they don't understand, that, that, that they're missing out on life, that life is passing them by. And, you know, all these good things, you Christians, you don't get to enjoy because you Christians and this narrow view of being a Christian and, and not getting the maximum out of life. And in fact, the opposite is true. And so Jesus, do you see, in John 10, precious passage that that is says, I have come. Well, let me back it up. The thief only comes to rob, to steal, to destroy. But I have come that you might have life and life to the full. The only person who gets to enjoy abundant life in this world, the way that God has created us to enjoy it, are believers. Do you see what you have in Jesus? It's incredible. God has given you an experience of life that transports you out of the realm of the ordinary into the extraordinary. 
because you have the Spirit of God who brings enlightenment as to how you can live and experience the joy and the abundance of life that Jesus has come to give to all who believe. What a gift. And you have this in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he's able to say, for he has known the mind of the Lord that he might instruct them, but we have the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when the unbeliever looks around and looks at you and with strange eyes and thinks that you're a little bit unusual and thinks that somehow you're being deprived of the enjoyment of life, you can turn around to them and say, no, it is you who are being deprived. For in Christ, through the Spirit, I get to enjoy a life that is not only eternal in the sense of length, but eternal in the sense of fulfillment. And I taste and experience that in the here and the now. And one day in the eternal round, I will experience that in all its fullness forever. All because of Jesus Christ. Death on the cross and resurrection from the dead, which the world out there says is foolish. We know differently. Now, I read a little story that might help us to grasp a little bit better this. A farmer was paid a visit by one of his city relatives. Before dinner, the farmer bowed his head and said, Grace, his sophisticated relative jeered. This is old-fashioned. Nobody with an education prays at the table anymore. The farm admitted that the practice was old and even allowed that there were some on his farm who did not pray before their meals. Justified, the relative remarked. So enlightenment is finally reaching the farm. Who are these wise ones? The farmer replied, my pigs. But it is true, is it not? I mean... Why would a Christian give money to church? Why would a Christian come to church and, and serve God? Why would you come to an evening service? Why would you give up your time and your resources and being engaged in, in church? Why would you, you live according a, to a certain ethical standard? I mean, why would you spend time on your knees in prayer? Aren't there better things you can be doing? Why open your Bible and read when there are so many other things you could be engaged in? Because we know that true wisdom comes from God. And the Spirit has enlightened our minds. So when we take that Word of God and we open up the Bible and we read it, what happens? The words literally jump out and God's spirit takes those words and he opens our eyes and he lifts the spiritual scales of darkness and our hearts become enthralled because God is speaking to us, the God of all glory. And so my dear friends, There is a good reason why you and I should be actively engaged in preaching the gospel so that the people out there who don't have the Spirit of God may have God's Spirit fall upon them and open their eyes, bring them into the kingdom that they may experience true life in Christ. For life can only be experienced in all its fullness in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's pray and plead and on our knees and beg that God, through his spirit, might open the eyes of the lost. Amen. Now, Father, we thank you for your word that just continues to enlighten us and enthrall us. Your wisdom is not of this world. And we understand that the rulers and the people of this world who are outside of faith don't understand. But we pray, O oh God, 
through a movement of the Holy Spirit upon this land in which we live, upon the community in which we are, that your Spirit would so move in such a powerful way that those who think the cross is foolishness would have come to understand its beauty, come to understand the Savior who was put to death on behalf of sinners, that they may come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and enjoy the wonderful life that you have come to bring all those who love you and are in a relationship with you. For Jesus' sake, amen.